Okay, good morning. Uh, we are really excited to kick this event off today. Um, I'm Chris Saha. I'm an associate professor of biomedical engineering as well as medical history and bioethics at the Wisconsin uh, Institute for Discovery at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And uh, today is uh, really a culmination of a year-long planning process um, uh, this, on, on this topic of gene-based therapies. I want to welcome everyone here in the room as well as folks online. Uh, I believe we have over 200 uh, folks registered to watch um, the webcast here. And th for those who are on Twitter, I'd like to um, note the, the hashtag here, which is hashtag RegenMedForum, if you'd like to uh, tweet about today. Let's see here. So this is uh, the planning committee uh, that I've been privileged to work with. Um, they're a great group. And you'll actually be hearing from all of them uh, today. Um, Many are in the forum. Some are outside of the forum uh, on regenerative medicine that's uh, supported here by the National um, Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. I want to uh, add my thanks for the, the sponsor from the National Academies for this workshop. And um, uh, also note, in particular, Celia here, uh, who's my uh, co-chair in leading this planning committee. And as we um, thought about what we wanted to discuss today, um, we really thought about how gene-based therapies um, have been going through clinical trials in uh, a fairly different manner. And uh, just one um, slide here about what many folks would consider the, the par traditional paradigm. Uh, so this is an infographic from Janssen. There are many others. Um, but you can see on the top left here, that um, there's usually, in this paradigm, thousands of compounds that get screened over three to six years to funnel it down to five compounds that then go um, through um, first in human trials uh, or, or clinical trials through phase one, 20 to 100 participants, up to thousands. Um, in phase three and several thousands in phase four. So these are stages of looking at safety and then efficacy. And this process traditionally takes about six to seven years. And then after that, uh, you, if you're lucky, uh, get one approved drug. And so the numbers here are notable. Um, there's thousands of compounds that take many years through extensive preclinical pre work, either in um, uh, animal models, uh, cell lines, et cetera. Then there's 20 patients, up to thousands of patients in the uh, clinical trials phase. And then even after that, there's a few years. So in total, uh, many folks would say that this takes about 10 to 15 years. And I would argue that what we're seeing recently, these numbers are quite a bit smaller. You don't see this so-called pipeline in, in, the, in the same way. And so what you hear, rather, are sometimes names of individual patients um, that are part of these tr clinical trials, some successes, some, some challenges. And uh, this is a photo here of Layla Richards um, from 2015. Uh, she was infused uh, with um, a gene-modified cell therapy. Uh, to treat her leukemia. And uh, some of you folks in this room may recognize some of these names. Uh, some of you online may see it, um, more as well. And um, in general, uh, the, the numbers of patients that are involved in these trials are in the 1 to 100 range. Um, the number of compounds that are tested are, are in the 1 to 10 range. And the amount of time pre in the preclinical stage is, is quite compressed. Um, sometimes as little as a year. And so um, these are essentially uh, prompting us to, to think about how to design these types of trials um, uh, perhaps differently, and we, there might be opportunities here um, to come together to, ma to make uh, more successes uh, on the front pages of uh, New York Times, uh, Guardian, Wall Street Journal, where these names have already been, been seen. The other thing to note is that the modalities tested here are more complex than small molecules. Um, and so this is a, 
Um, they're usually cells. There's, there's viruses involved, genome editors, CRISPR-Cas9-based strategies, antisense oligos, et cetera. And this video here is from uh, the National Institutes of Health, um, $190 million investment in somatic cell genome editing. I'm co-leading this uh, consortium. Um, and uh, there's really a plethora of new tools that they're trying to support. And I see uh, coming out uh, not only from this consortium, but throughout um, the world here, in, at least in the genome editing space. And with that modality, as well as many others, you can think about customizing it to particular genotypes or patient populations. So today's objective is to um, gain a better understanding of what complexities may uh, be prompted with some of these new technologies, these new uh, uh, types of trial designs, as well as discuss the ethical issues associated with uh, these types of trials. Um, there's, I think, challenging questions that require a, a diverse um, understanding of, per, of different types of perspectives that think about transitioning uh, into first in human trials, what type of evidence do you need to get there, um, and do that responsibly, what kind of optimal starting dose, stopping criteria, how to optimize delivery, and then also how you engage and communicate with the various people involved. And ultimately, what we're hoping to do is hear from folks in the room uh, about ways to improve the design of these trials um, one of the great um, privileges of being part of this forum is that it's a very powerful convener of different um, stakeholders and perspectives. And I think we've, um, with the help of the planning committee, been able to reach out to a lot of uh, important people and, and leaders in the field, as well as other um, folks that, that may have been associated with uh, just being part of these trials to get um, their thoughts on how to improve. So. Um, keep these uh, objectives in mind as you go through today, and uh, we'll try to promote as much discussion as possible uh, on these topics.